Ladies and gentlemen, I am here filling in for Megan Lewis. She had to take her children to the hospital. Let's hope that they get uh, recovered quickly and uh, everything goes well on that end. I'm filling in to ask questions about the other virgin births in antiquity course that you are going to be giving the webinar. And she sent me some questions via text. So here we'll just get right into it. Dr. Airman, what time periods and regions do these different virgin births occur in? Well, I'll tell you, the big issue that I'm going to, going to be addressing in my course is whether there were any other virgin births. <laughs> and so, so I can't answer that the question directly because uh, it presupposes something that I'm going to question. To, to, I can answer the question in the sense that it is absolutely true that there are um, uh, there are a number of stories from the ancient world where a divine being, a god, gets a mortal being, a woman, pregnant, and the child born is part divine, part human. Um, you get this in Greek and Roman mythology with someone, say, like um, Heracles, the Greek Heracles, the Roman Hercules, mother mortal, father uh, divine. You get it with um, some ancient philosophers, Plato, Pythagoras, supposed to be, have a divine father. You get it with historical figures, Alexander the Great, <laughs> Great Conqueror, yes, uh, Father was divine. And so, so you get, you do get these, you get it spread throughout the Greek and Roman worlds. Uh, in my course, I won't be talking about um, the uh, Eastern religion or anything like that, because my, my issue really is, is the virgin birth of Jesus described in Matthew and Luke, the only two places in the New Testament that mention it, is that virgin birth simply taking over a common motif throughout the Greek and Roman worlds and applying it to Jesus of a virgin birth, or is there something distinctive in it? Uh, and the big question is, were these other women who allegedly gave birth through a God, were they virgins or not? Well put, well put. Thank you for answering her question. And uh, these questions are formulated with the idea that there are other virgin births, but okay. Uh, okay. let's dodge that because your course is going to address it. But here's her questions. Apart yeah. from being born to virgin mothers, do these births or the children have anything else in common? Hmm. Yes, and the answer to that is absolutely right. These are mirac The miraculous births uh, are almost always used in order to show that this person who is quite amazing uh, started out that way. <laughs> so and the, the big issue is that, you know, there, there are some people who are far more powerful than the rest of us, just physically powerful. And some people who are far more beautiful than the rest of us, some people who are far more, more far more intelligent than the rest of us. So much so you wonder, how can that person be a human? I mean, look at that, oh my God. And so in the ancient world, you had people like that. and. Um, in some instances, they would say, well, it's because this person is actually partly God. Uh, the idea being that humans and gods are not radically different the way they are in the Christian tradition where you have the transcendent God and a bunch of mere mortals down here. It's that, you know, the hum humans, some are more like gods than others, and some gods are more like humans than others, and this is kind of this, this gradation. And so... Uh, when you have somebody like Heracles, the strongest man on earth, you know, it must be because his father is is a god or, um, you know, or somebody or Pythagoras, the greatest philosopher ever to live, it, his father must be a god. And so so that's that is it's the unique characteristics of these people that make them born of a divine being. Thank you so much for that. She also asks. Jesus' virgin birth is seen as a fulfillment of a prophecy in Isaiah, which isn't actually prophesying a virgin birth. Are any of the other virgin births in antiquity similar misunderstandings, or are they all clearly a virgin giving birth? Which comes back to your point about the course. <laughs> yeah, 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 but it's, it's you know, are were these other uh, births predicted uh, in advance? Um Sometimes in Greek and sometimes what happens is um, it, it's not that they're predicted centuries in advance, the way Christians think it happened with Isaiah. So Isaiah of Jerusalem was living in the eighth century BCE, and he has this passage that Matthew, living 800 years later, says is a prediction of the virgin birth. And so that's an 800, you know, 800 years later. There's nothing like that 
in the uh, in the Greek and Roman tradition. But there are instances in which uh, somebody is told in advance that there will be this miraculous birth. Um, and uh, a kind of a famous example of that is with uh, Apollonius of Tiana, who lived in the first century, the same, you know, he, he was, lived some decades after Jesus, but the same rough time period, whose mother uh, had a, a heavenly visitor, a divine being, a God, who came down and told her that she was going to have, you know, be pregnant by a God and that her child would be a son of God. And so that's that's comparable to uh, a prediction, but it's not like hundreds of years in advance the way uh, you have in the Christian tradition. Thank you so much. In the cultures these birth stories come from, what kind of things does being born from a virgin mother signify? Um, several things. I mean, mainly it means that these people are superhuman. Um, and um, as I was saying, it's when, when you don't have this great chasm between God and humans, but you have a kind of a continuum where uh, that then it's possible that some humans are more divine than others. And so, for example, the emperors. The emperors are, can be called sons of God. They can be called gods because, in a sense, they are, they are divine beings. These people who have these stories are told about them, um, whether it's Apollonius of Tiana, who could do great miracles uh, and was a great teacher like Jesus, or uh, someone like Romulus, the founder of Rome, or uh, Pythagoras, the great philosopher, these people have, they seem like superhuman capacities uh, and they have superhuman effects. They have way more effect on the world than you and I have. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, you know, how's that happen? It's because they really are part, part immortal. That's the way to explain their, their, uh, their uncanny um, qualities that don't seem to be those of the rest of us. In the cultures that produced these stories, were any of them as significant as Jesus's birth to early Christians? Um, I'd say absolutely not. Um, the, the virgin birth of Jesus is not early on a major deal in Christianity. In the early years of Christianity, it wasn't a big deal. It's hard to know whether most early Christians had even heard of any such thing. I mean, the apostle Paul never mentions a virgin birth, for example in all of his letters. The Gospel of Mark never mentions a virgin birth. The Gospel of John never mentions a virgin birth. And both of those Gospels actually seem to presuppose that he's not born of a virgin. And so, you know, it wasn't a big deal, but eventually it becomes a big deal. And by the fourth century, when they start devising these creeds that people have to confess uh, to, be, to be in the church, then being born of the Virgin Mary is, is a big part of that. So it does become a very big deal and down in the, in the modern world, of course, there are many Christian groups that claim that if you don't believe in the literal virgin birth, you cannot be a Christian. Um, other Christians say, yeah, you're nuts. Of course I can. <laughs> and so there's disputes within Christianity. But you don't get that in these other traditions. You know, you didn't have to believe that Romulus was born of the god Mars in order to be a Roman. <laughs> you know, and so it was. these were kind of like interesting stories uh, rather than like claims of faith, where they became Christianity. And the last of all, she says, do all of these stories occur in religious context, or are there any that might be considered something like folklore or political propaganda? Uh, I'd say most of them are, are folklore and, and political propaganda. Some of them are mythological tales, like the birth of uh, birth of Heracles, um, whose father Zeus comes, he's a gorgeous woman and uh, wants to have sex with her and comes down, takes on the shape of her husband. And so she thinks it's him, <laughs> has sex with him all night. And then Heracles is born. So you get, so that's that's in the realm of folktale and myth mythology bleeding over into folktale. And then you have um, great religious leaders who are said to be um, born of a God for political reasons, because it gives them clout. Um, when, um, uh, well, like as, as a really good example, the emperor, when Julius Caesar was assassinated, um, his, uh, his, uh, his heir, uh, Octavian, declared that after his death, he'd been taken up to heaven to become a god. Uh, and that was convenient uh, because it meant that as his, uh, his adopted son, uh, Octavian, Octavian was the son of God. 
<laughs> and so and so it kind of goes like that. You know, if your if your parent is a god, uh, you know, and you're a son of God, like people are not likely to uh, stand up against you <laughs> because you know that would be very bad. And so it does have a kind of a political power. Or Alexander the Great, you know, the great conqueror who's who was, um, how could he do all that? He must have had a divine parent. And that shows that if you follow the ways of Alexander, you, you show allegiance to the gods. Thank you so much, Dr. Ehrman. Everybody go in the link down in the description and sign up through there. You're helping Digital Hammurabi. You're helping Megan. You're helping Dr. Joshua Bowen. Go support them and sign up for the course. Megan, I hope your kids get better. Thank you, Dr. Ehrman. Thank you.